that makes sense. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, just want to do a quick sound check and a visual check. Let us know if you can hear us and if you can see us. Just go to the questions box and say, hey, Nick, we can hear you. We can see you. Perfect. All right. Folks, we're going to get started at 2.02, as we always do. Give people some time to uh, to come on in through GoToMeeting. Cesar, if you want to test really quickly the mouse on your side, if you can proceed. OK, testing the mouse. I think I can see the mouse. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and Melissa, now to you if you can just quickly. Yeah, perfect. Okay, folks, in the few moments left, um, first of all, <clears throat> I uh, I just wanted uh, to let you guys know Cesar has a little bit of bronchitis, so please be easy on him. Um, and uh, Quickly, if anyone is joining an exclusive webinar for the first time, we have a bit of a tradition that you introduce yourself, um, what your name is, what company you're joining from. Just while we let a few more people trickle in um, through GoToWebinar, because GoTo's been making lots of changes and it's been a little tricky for some people. So, who's here for the first time? Where are you uh, dialing in from? What's your name? And what company are you dialing in from? Got Nick from 4Mac USA. First time. Nick, nice to meet you. I'm also Nick. Um, Jesse from Embers Living. Hey, Jessica, nice to meet you. Thank you guys for joining. Anyone else new here? Got Lynn's. Uh, uh, here on behalf of Energy Control Technologies. That sounds great. Anne from Ballard Designs Group. Hey, Anne. Emily from um, David Orr Candle Co. Great industry. Um, well, let other people introduce themselves. Uh, got Bridget from Ohio Safe. That sounds awesome. Um, I'm going to check out all these websites later. And thank you, folks, for for joining. So we simplified what we wanted to present today. YouTube's awesome. People aren't using it enough. We thought let's just be like down to the hands on side, like 10 ways to use YouTube where we've been using it this way. It works with our clients in e -com. Um, But let's just do some quick intros to get started here. <clears throat> about exclusive, you know, easiest thing to know about us is that we have deep channel specialization. So we have a department for SEO, for Google Ads, Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. And we kind of break out our team that way, deep specializations. To make sure that those specializations are coordinated properly, we have a team of holistic strategists that do the coordination. And we have about 100 employees on the data science team that bring all that data together um, in our holistic technology. And that's it. We are better performance marketers because we do these three things really well. We do them for our wonderful clients. And with that, we go into introductions. Melissa, up first. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So I'm Melissa. I'm an SEM strategist here at Exclusive, and I specifically specialize in video and YouTube campaigns, um, specifically been managing YouTube probably since right when we start, or when I started about three years ago at Exclusive, about in 2019. Um, I do manage the video campaigns for a majority of our top clients specifically so just coming on board for video so excited to be here excited to answer your questions big fan of youtube both as a platform and advertising so excited to talk about it i can pass it to cesar hey everyone it's uh really nice to be back here again thanks nick for the uh, uh invitation and also melissa it's a pleasure to be here uh, co-hosting with you as well i know we work closely together you know on the day-to-day -day, so it's nice to have some big picture philosophical thinking here on the YouTube front. Um, anyway, so uh, my name is Cesar Coco. I'm a senior agency development manager at Google, and I have over seven years of experience working with agency development, uh, helping to drive that transformational change, uh, and one of those areas being uh, non-search diversification across Google. 
Uh, currently, I also focus in our um, agency privacy and measurement pillar uh, across the uh, U.S. agency team. So I have a strong focus on privacy and future-proof uh, products and roadmap here at Google as well. And I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much. Oh, and as Nick mentioned, yes, I'm a little under the weather, so I'm going to do my best not to cough. And I appreciate you guys uh, bearing with me here. Uh, thanks, Cesar. And um, I apologize because I have a paralyzed vocal cord, so I always sound like this, folks. But I'm testing a new microphone today, so looking for some feedback on whether you guys have too much feedback. Um, I've been here as of two days from now, it will be 14 years at Exclusive since we had a small team of six employees. I was brought on to Exclusive to uh, change our business from projects to solutions. I launched our SEO, our Google Ads, our uh, Amazon, our conversion testing, our email services, developed our philosophies, built out a strategy team, hired everyone, built it up, and then once the team was ready to, to go on their own, I shifted over to just working with clients who wanted to be our clients and figuring out the right growth plan for them. So uh, yeah, I might get a chance to meet many of you if you're interested in uh, our offer at the end of this, but let's dive right in. Cesar, can you talk a little bit about why um, why people should be advertising in YouTube ads, just in general, understand the magnitude of it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess uh, to kind of speak to the last couple of years, there really isn't a single business that hasn't been pretty significantly impacted uh, or forced to kind of reconsider the way that it's reaching consumers and is driving growth. So um, this is a really interesting moment in time, actually quite extraordinary. Um, and more viewers have actually turned to YouTube, YouTube now more than ever before. Um, and more brands are actually working with YouTube to help them connect with customers. Uh, so YouTube is actually reaching 92% of the U.S. population right now, 18 plus. And so what this means is that YouTube is, in essence, the second largest search platform in the world. So uh, YouTube, if it's not already on your radar, it definitely should be. Awesome. Cool. So... Um, wanted to talk to you all a little bit about um you know the post pandemic effects um that we've been seeing and we wanted to talk a little bit about how consumers um, in the past have historically listed discovery as one of those top reasons to go into a store but obviously now uh 70 of consumers uh bought from brands that they discovered on youtube instead and this is actually indicating that youtube is becoming a source of discovery for consumers now more than ever before due to this pandemic um, obviously, people beforehand prefer shopping in stores, and that was kind of like the key discovery moment, right? Feeling, seeing the things in store was so important to the consumer. Uh, but post-pandemic now, what we're seeing is that people are increasingly more comfortable with discovering new products online, uh, which is really interesting, right? Because this CPG customer, for example, where this data is from specifically, have been fiercely loyal to that in-store experience, whereas now uh, we're seeing that significant shift to online buying and YouTube discovery. So in the beginning of the pandemic, people were experiencing the super high anxiety. And I think Nick, Nick you and I discussed this during our last uh, conversation. And so people really wanted to feel safe and comforted. And they typically turned to those trusted brands that have been with them, uh, you know, since they were younger, those that they were familiar with through family or previous uh, shopping experiences. Um, so during that period, uh, when the pandemic was in you know, full blast, people would regularly search for brands um, um, that they knew. So uh, those branded searches were much higher than those generic searches. Whereas since the, that peak of the pandemic, what we've been seeing is the opposite. So we're seeing a lot more generic searches pop up, meaning that people are less brand loyal now and they're looking for more inspiration and excitement. Awesome, so uh, really what are shoppers thinking about now more than ever before? Uh, price really is becoming less and less of a priority overall. I know we hear a lot about Amazon and how price points are so key in the decision-making process for consumers, but really actually shoppers are much more focused now on inventory, a wide selection of products, and having their favorite products be available and readily available. Uh, so let's start thinking about how, yes, we can continue to appeal like that price point, in our creatives and in our conversations on YouTube and beyond, but also um, availability is key. 
and having that favorite product that your consumer is looking for and delivering it in the right time is now more important than price. So shoppers pay more attention to different kinds of ads that are, um, that are more personal to them, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about, um, first and foremost, consumers, they're, they're, they are purchasing more online than ever before. Uh, so we have a report here from Kantar that listed approximately like 2x in growth on online purchases across those CPG products. And so this is something really interesting that's been happening post COVID. Um, the shopper journey is changing now. So we want to think about new ways to sustain customer expectations. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the ways to do that is to sort of personalize as much as you can for your consumer. Uh, so shoppers are uh, across different areas of, of the journey and different areas of the shopping cycle. And so we want to speak to them where they are across the cycle in unique ways. So this also has to do with creative and the copy that we put into play. But it also needs to speak to actually carving out those paid media strategies across uh, what we call non-search, specifically YouTube, in a way that's meaningful and is that that and that's delivering those touch points for that user and that shopper across their cycles um, through the shopping journey. So uh, I, I keep saying cycle versus funnel, and I do that quite purposely and intently. So uh, for now, I'll pass it over to Nick to share a little bit more about uh, you know that di distinction there between cycle and funnel advertising. Yeah, thank you so much, Cesar. And uh, we wanted to talk about, before we go into our ways, is a framework for how to interpret these different ways. And um, it's tough. We're, we're losing a, a lot of information these days because of privacy. Um, we're also seeing platforms modify what you can do on them so that it's not just about the moment of search. There's there's remarketing, there's awareness targeting, there's a lot of influencer marketing. All these changes are asking us to look at how do we even look at marketing in the first place and should we be looking at it in a different way? And to be honest, until now, I mean, until like since the 1800s till now, we've all just thought about funnels and we've been told that funnels are the way to look at things. As marketers, that's not really helpful because a funnel is a, uh, a single person's journey and we can't even track them through that funnel. I mean, that funnel pops around so many different platforms, some that can be tracked, some that cannot, some that are ethereal and they come back. It's not easy to control. But you can't even figure out whether what you're doing is impacting people in a funnel. But the funnel still does give us some great ideas. If people generally find out about you, then they find you in search, then you should remarket them till they buy, remarket them to buy again, get them to advocate for you. So there are things to think about, but it's still not trackable. It's not a great way to, to formulate your marketing. Luckily, well, a new way of thinking has emerged, flywheels. Flywheels are a really simple concept where you're basically trying to find some cycle of momentum that happens in your business where the cycle feeds into itself virtuously and the stronger and faster that is the more you invest in it the stronger and healthier your business is what's cool about flywheels is virtually every part of that cycle is something that you can figure out how much marketing you're putting in and how much you are getting out at least from a response it may not always be revenue, but it's some form of response. This guy is thinking about just shifting gears. What we're doing is we try to get e-commerce. You know, we've been stewards of e-commerce for 25 years now, trying to get people to shift their paradigm here. We're basically saying, think about your marketing this way, see if it sticks. Focus on all the awareness activity that's happening in your ecosystem and how you can feed that. When people are searching and they're ready to buy and you show up, that's consideration activity. From that first engagement to the first purchase is conversion activity. Harness that, improve that. For past customers buying again, that's loyalty activity. Measure it, improve it. And advocacy is people talking about your brand and basically getting you out there, which again gets more awareness and the virtuous cycle gets stronger and stronger. 
We call this a virtuous activity cycle. It is all the activity that matters in your business. The more each of these five prongs gets strong, the healthier your business is, the harder it is for anyone to touch you. But there are some ways to like interpret this. Like there are several phases of activity and marketing can influence all of them. Any phase can generate momentum. We worked a lot of businesses recently that only have advocacy. Their entire business is based on that. Activity from each phase can be measured differently. And activity from one phase always ends up giving more activity in the next phase. That's how you understand this. So as we go through our examples, we're going to touch on, is this example about awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, or advocacy, or several? But before we do that, I just want to see what you guys are thinking. I mean, you probably don't think about your YouTube as much more than for our marketing or for awareness, but we're saying it should be for everything. And there's different techniques for all these five different phases. So what activities would you like to see a little bit more of for your business, if you could? I mean, ideally, if you could, through YouTube. Awesome, this is really interesting. Folks, please do answer. You can kind of uh, see where your peers are at, right? You know, walk away from here learning a few things, but also getting a gauge at the business owner and marketer level of what, what people are thinking right now. So we're gonna close this out in three, two, one. Let's see what everyone's looking at. So um, conversion. I mean, ideally everyone wants to get more conversion, right? Fantastic. Our first way is going to talk a lot about that specific. And then consideration. People happen to be searching, so how can we get them at that moment? That's 54%. 43% of you just want more awareness. 29% would love to get more loyalty. And 26% of you are thinking about advocacy. You should be thinking about advocacy a lot. Just think about how how little your competitors think about advocacy. You can see it right there, 26% of your peers think about advocacy. So those who are thinking about it are giving an edge. With that, we dive right in now to our 10 ways. And the first way, I mean, how bombed was everyone when iOS 14 came out and so much of Facebook remarketing was gutted? Well, Google, had already created a ad type that has great influence on YouTube called Discovery. Um, we'll talk about why it's such a great use. So with iOS 14, you know, summarize, it, it made it harder for you to remarket. Um, it made it harder for you to track sales that actually came from Facebook. So a lot of people saw their revenue that was tracked go down by so much, they're like, I'm not gonna invest in Facebook anymore. I've been investing for years. I have great ads. I know my targeting, but I'm just going to stop because it's not there. Well, we could take those great ads and that great structure. You could basically like copy and paste it into, into Discovery ads. And Discovery ads, they show on Gmail, on the Discovery app, as well as YouTube. That's a great way to supplement not just um, your Facebook, but one thing that Melissa mentioned, which she's seen, um, you know, theoretically it's a really profound thing where you could have a YouTube ad and a discovery ad both showing up in a search result on YouTube. You can kind of get double the coverage if you use discovery. Cesar, can you talk us uh, through discovery ads a little bit and maybe this little case study we have from, from Hug, please? Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate you touching on discovery ads as well, because I know that we were getting into this flow of YouTube. But essentially at, at Google, what we're seeing is, is that across all of your ad strategy, uh, video action campaigns or these YouTube campaigns that are specific for conversion or even YouTube for reach when combined with discovery ads is going to get you much more conversions um, and a much stronger brand lift. And so what we are um, actually looking at here is discovery ads as a cross-channel campaign type. As Nick mentioned, it runs on YouTube, Discovery on Gmail, as well as Google's uh, Discovery feed, if anybody out there has a Pixel. I know, haha, very funny. But it's a great phone, I have one, I'm obsessed with it, and I always use my Discovery feed, and it's a great opportunity to capture 
uh, 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 discovery uh, or consideration audiences and combine that with your YouTube activity for even more conversions. Um, and so I wanted to share a really quick discovery success story with you today. Uh, one of our uh, you know, strongest retail customers, UGG, was hoping to drive that consideration for a wider range of products. And when I say strong is that they're always willing to try our different and new campaign types, which is really great. Um, and UGG actually uh, focused all of their marketing on these visually rich channels uh, across Google and beyond um, that would allow it to best showcase its premium offerings that marry that unrivaled comfort that UGG is known for with that timeless fashion piece as well. So um, the brand actually turned to these discovery ads as a way to extend the reach of its existing social campaigns because there's a lot of overlay there between Facebook activity and discovery ads in the sense that you can actually activate Facebook audiences on discovery, which is really cool, um, among several other features that make it very comparable to social um, and much more privacy safe, right? Because the Google users that are logged in are not at risk towards that iOS 14 and uh, privacy ever-changing landscape as much as other players are <laughs> uh, Facebook. Uh, so discovery ads actually here for UGG um, delivered a really strong increase in that high quality traffic that they were looking for to the site and it actually helped them achieve that 10 to 1 return on ad spend for this period. Um, and these visual ads were super engaging, uh, those click-through click rates as well went up um, and the overall performance was much stronger and in a future-proof and privacy safe way. So while we are going to continue talking a little bit about YouTube, I want us to zoom out and think about non-search through the lens of YouTube as well as discovery ads and think about how you can activate an audience strategy across both of these campaign types um, to capture not just uh, action, but consideration as well as awareness. Uh, so I want to kick it over to Melissa uh, to tell us a little bit more about how we can further sort of diversify those awareness plays in our strategy. Thanks, awesome. Great. Uh so I'm going to run through a bunch of different topics of ways that we improve video. And one of them I think is one of the most valuable things that you can do as an easy step to improve your video campaigns is diversifying your top of funnel or your awareness activity with the audience viewed certain video at or viewed certain videos as ads, or if you shorten it to view video ads. Um, what we see a lot of people come to exclusive who are looking to improve their video strategy that they'll come in and they'll tell us that they've been marketing or they've been running cold audience campaigns that they've been running remarketing campaigns on video the trick with cold audience though is you are relying on these people coming to the site and i mean think about it when you watch youtube the first time you're introduced to a brand are you instantly going leaving youtube searching on the internet and going to the site like most of the time not i love youtube and i never do that but if they're engaging with your video ads you can then remarket to them through audiences on google um, let me show you on this slide here. So there's this option here called view certain videos, ads, ads. You literally, if your YouTube is linked, you just set it up and link it. And it's that stage between like total awareness, they've never heard of you and that remarketing phase. If they're engaging, we can remarket to them. And that then re, you know, drives home that, uh, drives home the message that you're trying to get to these people. And then hopefully they'll come to the site. Um, it's a much better shot than just throwing your message out in the dark and hoping someone eventually looks you up and comes to your site. Um, so this is a great Melissa, oh yeah. To, to, to clarify, it's like if if they're absolutely cold, your cold audience targeting will keep targeting them. But the moment they've watched a video, they're no longer cold, so your targeting no longer affects them. And if that that video did not lead to a click, like you're basically out of the cold audience, you haven't made it into the site visitors audience. But that's like that's a huge group. Yeah, it's amazing. We get lost to the internet if we don't if we don't do some intentional messaging to keep going with them. Uh, the next one to talk about is balancing your settings for awareness, conversion, and loyalty. I'm going to this slide here. Um, so there's two different campaign, campaign types we use, primarily and exclusive for video campaigns. We've This is a tried and true method. We've been doing this for a while now of how to best go after remarketing audiences and how best to go after top of funnel cold audience awareness audiences. 
Um, first is video reach campaigns and how that works is its goal is reach, like it says. So the goal is to drive as many impressions as possible at a set CPM. Um, the benefit of having a set CPM is you know exactly what you're paying for those thousands of impressions. There's going to be no surprises there. It's not going to, you know, you set a 15, it's not going to spend 40. It's going to be exactly what you predict and you get to choose your audiences. It is great for top of funnel. It's super efficient at driving those audiences. But again, like per the last slide, you can't just rely on video reach to bring in cold audiences because if they don't make it to the site, they're lost to the internet and you're just hoping somehow they'll find you another way. Um, and how we get further with that is video action campaigns. So video action campaigns are specifically made through Google to drive conversions and revenue. Uh, while video reach uses CPM targeting, video action is specifically set up to go after your conversions by using either different, there's a couple automation strategies, but all of them, the goal is revenue. Um, you can use this on those viewed video ads audiences. You can use them on past purchasers. You can use them on cart banners. It works at every stage because they're people who are lower in the funnel, but we still want them to make conversions. And it works really well. I can speak from experience. This campaign drives strong revenue. It drives ROAS. Sometimes people think video is inefficient and it'll never work. I have tons of clients who have like over 10 to ones, over 13 to ones with video action because it is that successful. Um, so I highly, highly recommend using it. And the next one we do is using your feed in video reach and action. So it works in both to keep it optimized. So if you run shopping or if you run display um, with dynamic remarketing, any of those, you're familiar with how the feed works. It shows products that you sell on your site on different placements around YouTube or around Google. And now you can also add it onto your YouTube campaigns as well. So for an example of what it looks like, oh, I've been a couple slides, but You'll see an example in a second, but how it works is it shows products below the video itself. So if you're watching on your phone, it'll be like right below the video itself. If you're watching it on a laptop, it's likely gonna show like next to the video, but it shows products. And if they've been to the site before and you've looked at products, that is a great opportunity for marketing those products right back to those users. Um, we did a lot of side-by-side -side testing. I mean, Google will give you their data on how things work, but we always like to also verify that and test it ourselves at Exclusive. And I can say every instance where I tested it, it did include, increase your click-through rate. And we'll say YouTube is not known for having super strong click-through rates. If you watch YouTube, you're likely not looking to leave the platform because you're engaging with a social media, you wanna be on the platform, but this does improve your, improve your click-through rate. So any chance we can get to make your click-through rate better on YouTube, we should do because people are not as inclined to use leave YouTube as they are in like Facebook or Instagram. Um, so this one example for a client I had it increased by 73%, which was fantastic, but it increased all of them that I've tried it for. And we'll pass it over to Cesar for another example. Awesome. That's uh, that's really cool, Melissa. I also want to emphasize that you know showing the different merchant center categories, maybe combining them with unique creatives. Uh, for example, having a, a cast showing the different sweaters and showing that category level uh, feed data is a really interesting way to personalize for your audience. So something to think about there. But um, I also wanted to shift the focus here to Julia, China's leading direct-to-consumer jewelry brand. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about Julia because uh, they were really skeptical of using consideration and awareness solutions in general. Um, so uh, like many of you all, they were really focused on that bottom line efficiency across conversion activity. Um, and you know, typically the conversations between this team and Julia around discovery ads and YouTube ads was like kind of a, a non-starter. Um, before this experiment. So what was really great is to have a customer really choose to kind of dive into and carve out that innovation testing across non-search, even though they had those hesitations. Uh, you know, following the guidance of their agency and Google team advice, uh, they were able to implement this experiment where they leverage different shoppable ad formats across YouTube, um, and pretty soon discovery will be seen the same. Um, and this led to an increase of over 39% in conversion rates and a drop in the cost per conversions of roughly 16%. Uh, so the really important thing to note here is that not only did Julia leverage those different shoppable formats across non-search, uh, but they also use media mix modeling to understand not just the bottom line return of YouTube in terms of return on ad spend, but what was YouTube and Discovery's assist role across other channels. Uh, so think YouTube to search or YouTube to discovery. Um, and this uh, really combined with the shoppable features, that kind of uh, uh, YouTube across the journey and assisted conversion value combined with those shoppable features itself that bring users 
closer to the actual product page and conversion action. Um, that was really the key to success here for, for Julia. I wanted to share that with you all today. Um, so, uh, Melissa, I believe it's back to you to tell us a little bit more about what we can do with feeds. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to jump into, so the next thing that we can do to really improve your video campaigns is using placement exclusion lists. Um, so if you've run video campaigns before and you are thinking, this doesn't work, my ROAS is in the gutter, nothing works. Um, besides trying out the video campaign types, which is like the first step I would honestly say is video reach and video action, using them the correct way, is doing some steps to make sure that we are showing our ads on the right channels and showing our ads on the right video. Um, Speaking from very personal experience running video ads, not every placement is quality. In fact, there's a lot of really bad placements on YouTube. Um, and the way to get around that is to really monitor where your ads are showing. There is a tab called literally where ads showed, um, and it'll show you every single placement you show on, how many impressions it got, how many views it got, the view rate, click through rate, anything like that. Um, exclusive because we've been doing this for so long, so long, we've accumulated a list of pretty much 10,000 placements that we do not ever want our ads to show on. Um, a common issue that we run into with video campaigns, um, this will go to the next slide. I don't know why it won't let me click. Nick, are you able to click the next slide? There we go. Um, so one thing we'll see a lot on the video campaigns is that they'll show placements on children's YouTube channels, um, specifically teenage channels or teenage boy channels, a lot of like gaming that is younger humor. You can tell when you watch it that it's, it's definitely for like a 14 year old demographic, um, mobile apps, anything like that. Um, so if you're seeing something like Coco Melon or Nursery Rhymes or you know even Quizlet, frankly, tends to be younger demographic, um, we don't want to show on those because just using common sense, if it's a Nursery Rhymes YouTube channel, it's likely the iPad got thrown in front of the kid and it's not mom and dad actively watching Coco Melon. Um, if it's a nursery channel, if you haven't heard of it either, it's for children. Um, so what we do is we intentionally go through, build a placement exclusion list. We preemptively upload our 10,000 placement lists, but also for every client we go through check, especially for new campaigns, like weekly, sometimes twice a week until we feel really confident in our placements. And I can tell you, it doesn't, it's not a lifelong project of figuring out your placements list. It'll eventually, it'll work itself out. It will look better, but it does take a little bit of legwork right away. I think there's a delay on my clicks, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, and then the last one is just narrowing in on relevant audiences with custom audiences. Um, so you'll see in Google, there's a ton, ton of options for you using you uh, for YouTube targeting, but you can also use them on display, discovery too, um, in markets, affinities, similar to detailed demographics, everything like that. There's a ton of options, but when you hover over them, you may end up seeing that the audience pool pool is huge, like 500 million users, a billion impressions. Like for most of most people on YouTube, that's just astronomically high to think that you can target all of these people. It's a super, super wide net. So using custom audiences will help you really hone in on those users you want to show for. Some options are using like your top search terms that have converted in the past on search or shopping. So it could be like top 100 search terms that are tried and true. We know whoever searches for, you know, Nike running shoes is going to convert on our site. Um, so we'll use that information to build out custom audiences, but you can also use other tools that you know, maybe audiences or similar audiences have worked on Facebook and you want to create relevant specific keywords relating to those, um, you can build them out here. So there's a ton of options. You can do pretty much anything you can think of with custom audiences you can do, um, and it'll really help you narrow in on that top of funnel, improve overall bro as make sure, you know, they're going through the cycle properly and it's not just for throwing our money at whoever we think vaguely relates to what we're trying to sell. I'll pass it over to, uh, to Cesar. Yeah, actually, uh, Melissa, you pretty much nailed it there. Uh, so you do have the option to build your own audiences on YouTube. Uh, so you could basically bring together the power of that Google data as well as your own internal audience definitions uh, to build different unique and tailored audiences. Um, so for instance, let's think about how you can build a broad audience around, let's say like passion points that you might have using Google signals like, app download or URLs that deliver really strong reach. So you can also capture attention during purchase decisions by reaching people actively searching for your products on Google. I think Melissa, you mentioned that as well. So taking those top 100 search terms and creating YouTube audiences based off those to drive some additional action. 
is really cool. Um, and for example, to put this into perspective even further, if you're a retailer and you want to build out a Cyber Monday enthusiast audience segment and activate them on YouTube uh, in order to drive additional awareness, you could do something like uh, build an audience using electronic store location categories. Um, people who have downloaded the Amazon shopping app. Uh, and also have an interest in those best Cyber Monday deals. So you can combine different levers like that on YouTube and that's where you're gonna get your custom audience power, um, which will ultimately be focused in there on being able to drive forward consideration and action strategies <laughs> a little bit stronger. Um, and then I wanna talk to you all about a different audience type here, your affinity audiences. Now these are really fun. Um, so this is also, I would uh, think about this, uh, activating these audiences across like your awareness part of the cycle. Um, so how does it really work? These affinity audiences are Google's pre-built audiences. Um, so like think cat lovers, uh, you know, uh, uh, night outs. And so these are really affinity audiences that you can use not to drive that immediate action, but like cast a net across you know, Google's audiences as a whole, uh, narrow in a little bit to those that have some affinities that might mesh well with what you offer as a brand or the category you operate in. And then you can start kind of fishing for people who go further down into conversion and closer to conversion, and then kind of capture that first party data. So you can play with these, not only to drive um, consideration and awareness, but to drive your own first party data. So an example here is if we think about Renault, who wanted to increase awareness of a new SUV launch, uh, they actually zoomed in on Google's light TV viewers affinity audience, which is a really good one because that's a segment that's been traditionally really hard to capture um, across traditional media like TV. So um, this audience targeting actually resulted in a 43% increase in view rates on YouTube videos and an efficient cost per view uh, that the advertiser was hoping to hit. So, um, wanted to talk to you about these affinity audiences because they're super cool. And if you don't really know what kinds of affinity audiences you should be playing with, I just want to remind you that as a Google Premier Partner, Exclusive has access to different audience development tools. For example, Insights Finder, which is really cool. Um, basically, your agency and Google team can help you put together an audience strategy and give you insights on which audiences are the ones that over index or index super high on your business and the category you operate in. Awesome, so let's shift into in market. Uh, so Google can also help you find really qualified audiences um, across consideration here with in market audiences. Um, so here these are uh, things like life events, like about to get married or just got married, about to move. And so these are the life events and in-market segments that you want to think about to drive consideration. And one example of doing this well is Airbnb, um, who connected with an audience while they were actively planning and researching travel, but didn't necessarily know where they were going to stay or potentially where they were going to go. But these audiences, these in-market audiences that Google offers you free of charge at no additional cost, actually was able to um, help Airbnb target a segment of customers that were in market ready to convert at just the right time, um, which ultimately left to an increase in 522% um, in Lyft and brand interest across Google search for Airbnb, which is not bad at all. Awesome, so um, we wanna talk a little bit more about these custom audiences. Um, these are the ones that are super close to um, kind of like that that's an immediate conversion um, efficiency that you're looking for. So in order to make sure audiences are close to action, you can also bring your own data. Um, you can bring phone numbers, emails, mailing address, basically anything you're comfortable sharing with, um, with Google, um, and obviously in a privacy safe way. Um, we can activate that first party data you've got through our customer match tool. Um, to help create sort of remarketing audiences that you can capture across um, the conversion cycle. So um, you can also reach audiences um, for conversion um, through the custom audiences solution that we have. So uh, this basically means re-engaging an audience on YouTube that searched for you on Google, which we mentioned about uh, at the very beginning. I um, just want to reiterate here that we saw um, an interesting example I wanted to share with you with Dota. Uh, which is a recruitment and job placement company that uh, was looking to drive online registrations on YouTube. 
uh, by reaching people actively searching for new jobs on Google. Um, so in that example, Dota was able to generate an 8x increase in conversions. So just wanted to reiterate again that custom audiences are a very powerful tool to drive that efficiency, but definitely don't sleep on those consideration and awareness audiences, which will cash that fishnet for you to be able to drive an even more powerful and stronger return across these custom audiences and, and, and customer match techniques uh, across conversion. Awesome. Um, also wanted to know that there are video campaigns that um, uh, when they are targeting online sales or drive leads marketing objectives, you can use optimized targeting, which is a feature to find new and relevant users. Um, obviously, this is kind of like an investigative tool that Google offers to customers and agencies. So that doesn't mean that optimized targeting is always going to get it right and that you're always going to find the right, uh, the, the right audiences based off the audiences that you already know that are working, but it's a great feature to add on top of whatever you're doing to expand your audiences and expand your first party data. As long as you're giving your agency and Google team that flexibility to say, hey, that test, that search for additional and new audiences is also very valuable. So let's think about how we're playing with that efficiency goal, that return, in order for us to learn more and expand the potential to expand our audiences. Awesome. So I think that's all on my end for now. Um, and over to you, Melissa, once again. Awesome. So another way that we can really improve in performance overall um, with YouTube is device-based campaign structuring. Um, so in the past, we used to pretty much always say no to TV, negative 100% on TV. It's not efficient, just drive conversions. Um, with changes to YouTube, especially YouTube is now included in um, DDA, which is data-driven attribution, which means Google can now much better track um, what impression or what view led to a conversion later on down the road. Um, because of that, we've actually seen TV does pretty well. TV has pretty high engagement for the most part. I, my theory is people don't skip as much on TV because they're just in the TV zone. You're watching TV, you don't really care about commercials as much. Um, but because of that, we still don't want to forget that devices do drive performance and we still think it is valuable for you to optimize them. It's just not as black and white as turn TVs off, TVs don't work. Um, TVs are a smart device now. People link their YouTube um, on their TV to the YouTube on their laptop, to the site on, you know, to the Chrome where they go to your site. Um, so just keep an eye on that. TV and mobile tend to have more impressions. They tend to be lower CPMs, but what's the conversion rate look like? What's the ROAS look like? Especially for video action campaigns, which are bottom of the funnel. Um, for top of funnel, you may just be looking for what's the most efficient way I can get impressions, and that would be TV mobile typically. Um, so just don't forget about it. Keep up with the trends that are going on with devices, but remember it's not black and white like it used to be. Great. Awesome. Um, and then another one we want to look at is just addressing sluggish performance with fresher content. This is not, I would say, a quick hit or like an easy tips and trick. This is a much bigger project, but if you're going to advertise on YouTube, you have to invest in your creative in some way or another. Running the same ad over and over for months to years even, I've seen that happen. You're going to lose engagement. People aren't going to be as interested. So you want to keep that top of mind as you optimize your YouTube campaigns. Um, there's pretty much two ideas behind it. First is rotating out your content. So if you're running, if you have one video that you made a couple of years ago and you've been running it forever, it's probably time to refresh it. Um, ways to measure this to see like, is there actually a decline in interest? I mean, maybe your engagement's perfect and it hasn't declined and this is the, you found the golden nugget of video, keep running it. But if you're seeing average watch time per impression is dropping off, your view weight's dropping off, which is, they're both just measures of engagement, um, it's likely time to get some new creative out there and just try to get some new messaging. Um, on the other side of it, you can, we recommend running multiple creative at once to really test what works best for your audience, but also at the different um, like cycle stages for your audiences. What works at the top of the funnel might not work at the bottom of the funnel or up the cycle. I need to get the funnel out of my terminology. Um, but basically, so at the top, we always want to think about like why they should buy with you, whereas the lower they get, you want to think about what they should buy from you, especially with those loyalty customers and advocacy reminding them of new products that come out, testing different value props that work at all these different stages is really what's gonna help you drive home your brand and your site and get those conversions to come through as we work them through, you know, all the steps in the process to get that conversion. Neat. 
I believe this is a Cesar. Yes, this is Google. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, I think advocacy is really interesting because we're really looking at an opportunity now to create strategies for our business, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, strategies that go beyond just that conversion. So we talked about how after the pandemic and after this kind of increase in loyalty, once we were more secure in what was happening and what was going on in the world, we became less loyal. And so when we think about advocacy strategy, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's really important to think about what are the solutions in our, in our toolbox Cesar, if you want me to take over, uh, I'm going to take over for Cesar. It's okay, you, okay. you sure? All right. So, thank you for presenting this <clears throat> your illness. Thanks, everyone. Sorry. <clears throat> so, what are our solutions in our toolbox? <clears throat> oh my gosh. Cesar, why don't we come back to this? Or I'll, I'm, I'm going to quickly I think come I, get, I, think I got it now. You sure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So we want to think about what are those uh, solutions in our toolbox that can help us capture advocacy strategies <coughs> uh, the best. And so at Google, through YouTube, we have something called Brand Connect, which is really interesting. And so through Brand Connect, what we can do is uh, we can sort of hard harness the power of YouTube, <coughs> um, of YouTube creators, excuse me, um, in a super organic, trusted way that resonates with the target customer that you're trying to reach. And so really what this means <coughs> is that we're connecting and creating a platform where our customers can connect with creators and drive forward really interesting, managed, scalable, and branded content campaigns with those creators and up-level those through audience-based matchmaking, which basically means that you use the power of Google algorithms and YouTube algorithms to connect your brand and your business with a creator who is very like-minded with regards to your values, which is really cool. Um, so an example of Brand Connect here I wanted to share with you all today is uh, Calvin Klein, who met, who partnered with Brand Connect recently to bring to life their I Speak My Truth and My Calvin's campaign on YouTube, which was really interesting. And we wanted uh, to work with Calvin Klein to make sure that they had a chance to not just speak through the lens of Calvin Klein values, but what are those creator values that are related to Calvin Klein. So you see the difference there to help drive forward a, a meaningful advocacy strategy. So the campaign itself actually brought inclusivity to the forefront and Calvin Klein leaned into a really diverse mix of creators, which is really awesome to see, and different content formats. Uh, so <clears throat> this is just one example of how you can utilize uh, YouTube and YouTube's Brand Connect for a uh, meaningful advocacy strategy. Um, and back to you, Nick. I'm so sorry for the coughing, everyone. Thanks for Don't understanding. Don't apologize. Thank you for, as uh, as Nick has said here, thank you for, for being a trooper and going through that. And I hope you feel better. I, I think that was your last slide. Uh, so, so appreciate that. Thank you, Cesar. Um, the last thing we wanted to cover before we go into um, questions is, um, <clears throat> obviously, with, without cookies, we're we're doing a lot of advertising that is not connecting to a sale. There's points at which a person um, interacts with an ad and does something and those dots are not connected. That's the problem with a cookie-less world. Um, luckily, there's there's always a solution either in strategy or big data for all the changes that are happening these days. Luckily, big data is coming through. Um, media mix modeling has been around for a long time. Media mix modeling tries to look at the correlations between types of ad spend and the growth of your business. And if we can find the correlation using what are called regressive models, so algorithms and we crunching through statistical data, then you can start to make some projections. And you could say, here's the uh, potential ad spend you could be spending with their forecasted revenue. The goal that we had for our media mix model, which has been expanded and expanded and now has run across over 100 clients um, without, without worrying about statistical validity, we've been able to achieve validity for 
It's between 120 and 150 right now, clients. What we're able to do is basically say, okay, um, instead of the classic, when you increase ad spend, efficiency drops, which is, you know, people understand that that is typically what happens. We're saying the data is telling us you can actually increase spend by this much without losing efficiency, without losing fidelity. That's the most important question. It's not how much can I increase ad spend. You can increase ad spend 10x. Your efficiency is going to go in the toilet. We're trying to figure out how much can you increase ad spend without losing efficiency. And it starts to bring in all the answers about YouTube and display and Facebook and and other ads on Google that right now we're, we're lost in a little bit of a lack of data at the platform level. And this goes beyond platforms to figure out the bigger answers. It's phenomenal. It's the right time for it. We're really excited that we have a tool that is coming so close to predictions because that's really the biggest challenge. And this is included for our team, for our uh, for our customers. So real quick, folks, I know you have questions and we have the right people to answer those questions. Before we get to questions, I just want to offer um, a growth plan. Uh, this is a this is a process that we've we've kind of developed over the years. It, again, with exclusive, you know, we have deep specialization. So we have a lot of channels that we specialize in. We have strategy that coordinates across those channels and technology that brings all the data from all those channels into one system and trying to figure out how to take what we've built and apply it to your business means we have to go through a pretty rigorous process so we created this four-step process and basically offering this to anyone who's watching right now and they they just haven't had a partner that's listened or cared enough to figure out all the nuance of what actually needs to be done to grow your business so the four-step process fairly straightforward first step candid fit conversation. Um, you talk to someone on our team and they're gonna get a sense of whether your business, your business model, your needs actually are fit with what we've built. Yet that's probably gonna be the case. Um, if, you're, if your instincts tell you it's the case, it's probably right. Then you meet myself or another member of our team who will start to figure out, you know, what have you done in the past? What does your business model look like? What's success for you? What have other agencies done well or bad? What are your competitors doing? And we'll basically go through a complete checklist of um, inputs that we need to be able to create a good growth plan. And then we'll take a few days and we'll put together this massive comprehensive growth plan. And there's a few things we always cover. Why we believe in your business? Because we need to understand what we need to elevate to. The audience level after you've told us who your competitors are what are your competitors up to what kind of ad spends and keywords and x factors everything we need to know what their game is we will look at the virtuous activity cycle and try to figure out you know you're ballooning here in terms of your investments but you're missing all this activity we we'll use some really cool scraping tools to figure out what customers are seeing when they try to engage with your business or try to find you on organic and search and Amazon. We'll harness the power of consumer behavior to figure out the ways to activate better responses from your customers to drive um, MER to the highest potential. And we'll also scrape and see what your competitors are doing on YouTube and marketing and email so we can make good recommendations. Then we will just package it all up, neat pricing and team structure, onboarding plan. Here's the demo of our technology. So we try to cover a lot in that growth plan. And if you have a lot of data, like in Google Ads or Amazon or Facebook or uh, SEO, we may do some miscellaneous deep dives as well and just bring in members of our team like Melissa um, to kind of um, tackle those specializations. So. Just gonna see if anyone's interested. Basically saying, if you are if you have uh, a group of agencies or one agency or you know, vendors and they just don't seem to care as much as you care about your growth and you're wondering if anyone else can do it better or be a little bit more focused on 
what it's going to take to to truly succeed, then uh, just say yes. Again, it's free. We're not going to we don't charge for this. This is our vetting process to figure out what we want to commit to. Here's what we want to do. If you believe it, if you see all the proof in it, give us a chance. And then we seamlessly take everything that we've done in the growth plan and bring it into our solution side. This is a seamless handoff. Members of our team actually work on both sides. So I'm going to close this in uh, three, two, one. And thank you folks for for answering that. And let's see if you have any questions. So you've got Cesar from Google here. You've got our YouTube expert. You can ask any question. As detailed as you want to go. Actually, that's exactly what Melissa was hoping for. That we get some questions where it's like, oh, I've tried this. And you don't need to do it in that voice. But if uh, you have a question, no one else has answered. No one else has wanted to answer. Let us answer it for you. There was an earlier question that was about the 10 to 1 return in the chat. That was, was it with just new acquired customers or a mix of return? The over 10 to 1 was initially just remarketing. We pretty much said, well, test remarketing and it, how well it goes from there is, you know, how much we can scale. Um, and I just double checked, so I'm not pulling this completely out of thin air, we've dropped to a seven to one with cold, which I still think is really good. So we went from 10 yeah. to one remarketing, seven to one overall. Melissa, I think that was for Cesar with the UG example, because I remember the oh. timing. I know we've we've had a few 10 to one discussions, <laughs> but uh, Cesar, do you, have a, do, you, do you know whether that was uh, a new acquired customers or return in, in there as well for the UG example? So, um, yeah, so that was across uh, all, all customers, uh, but I wanted to just clarify that we are seeing an increase in control in these new campaign types like Discovery and YouTube and Smart Shopping, for example, to target new customers as well as existing in your settings. So uh, even so, you will be able to kind of control who you're targeting uh, through that lens, the new versus existing. And just remember, you can always use your list of existing customers, put it in through customer match, and use that as a means to also specifically target or exclude existing customers. Awesome. Uh, several questions came in now. Um, guys, feel free to answer them as, as you see fit. Okay, let's see. Trying to figure out how to scroll. One of the questions is if your company doesn't have resources to invest in high quality creative, what would you focus on? Um, in terms of creating video, so I'll say if you're, with, excuse me, if you're with exclusive, we actually have tools that we can, it's pretty cost effective with through our Google Premier partnership that let us build video assets. So if you have a picture, we can turn that picture into a high quality video. I've even side by side tested like these template formats against client creative and the template formats will honestly sometimes beat out with view rate, with engagement. Um, and it's part of what we do. It, it can be included in your creative budget really easily. There, I, I think it's like $350 per video. Like it's very cost effective. Um, in terms of if you wanna make them yourself and you don't have access to a Google Premier partner, um, I mean, my personal, best recommendation is Canva, honestly. It is really, really easy to make videos on there. It's super user-friendly, um, but of course, happy to collaborate too on that if you wanted to join us. I'll add that we have an entire creative team, our Studio X team, um, for clients that sign on for full creative. We do everything from ideation to filming out on uh, location and putting it all together for you. Uh, we pre-plan who the target audience is, the persona, what channels we're going to place it on, what the audience strategy is in general. Um, and then we build from there. So um, there's always an option for for that, for at least for our clients. And most agencies have some option there. Um, and with regards to how much or how, how large your first party data list size should be, um, it's always changing. It depends which campaign, which feature. So, you know, feel free to follow up with Nick, and he'll loop in Melissa or myself and we'll get you those details. But the good news is it's always getting smaller. So it used to be a really large minimum, but now it keeps getting smaller so that 
um, we can accommodate more mid-market advertisers with our customer match and, and custom audience tools. Awesome. Um, another question was, um, are you seeing YouTube as a better way to connect, contact new customers over Google search or display ads? Um, it, I honestly would say it depends on your KPI. So yes, I think YouTube is a fantastic way of connecting with users because you can tell a story on YouTube on a way you just can't tell it with display. Um, they're seeing a picture, whereas YouTube, they're hearing what we're telling them. They're seeing what we're telling them. They're reading it if you have, you know, uh, text on the screen itself. I think it is one of like the best ways you can connect with users. Um, if your goal though is like clicks to the site that we can directly measure from campaign to campaign, I'd honestly point you even in the direction of discovery because it does have really strong click-through rates and you're going to see that traffic come through. Um, but if you're going for just brand awareness, you want those impressions and engagement that view rate that is really filling the top of the funnel or getting that first phase of the cycle going and then moving them through it, video is a surefire bet. It's the best storytelling platform out there. Um, I just want, I want to kind of, I'm reading through some of these. I just want to make sure we're picking some questions that are really scalable that many of you can benefit from their responses for. So the one here that I think is really important, um, in addition to all of your other ones that are more nuanced, um, with regards to like what video ads are trending, uh, through our premier partnership, Exclusive is receiving our ABCDs of creative package. And so that's something we regularly update used on AB test, uh, based on AB testing in different areas of study experiments, observations, and so forth to create that ABCD framework. And so feel free to lean on them and their in-house creative teams to let you know exactly what it is that's trending at any given time. Um, but to answer your question, Richard, what's trending in 2022 depends on the audience you're targeting and it depends on the area of the cycle of the uh, uh, of the user journey that you're also focusing on. So it's hard to answer that, but I'm sure that you're in the right place to get those uh, get those best practices and trends um, as they are happening in real time. If you're interested, there's also a page that where YouTube like ranks the best video ads of the year. So it's not gonna give a breakdown of like film versus motion design, but you can totally check it out. I get a lot of inspiration from that page. Um, I'm hoping we can link it out because it is, I think it is a super helpful page for people who are getting started and like, I don't really know even how to make a video ad or what it should look like. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so your average investment for YouTube, um, so typically what we want to look at is a specific percentage of what is your cost per action or your return on ad spend on search. I believe it's something like increasing that by 5x. Um, uh, don't quote me on that. We can get you that overview of the best practice. And then so your return on ad spend in YouTube needs to be a little bit greater, right? And so because of the assist assisted conversion value that we're seeing YouTube is playing across so many different other areas. And then you wanna take a percentage multiplier of that uh, return on ad spend um, to, to, to determine your daily budget across YouTube. Um, so in essence, what you wanna do is you wanna think about um, what is like what you're seeing on search and then your team at Exclusive can help you determine what's the best average daily budget or monthly budget for your YouTube activity. One just came through for average CPMs. Um, I can tell you, so for video reach campaigns, you can set your CPM. So it's kind of whatever you want. I typically start around $10, $15 for cold audiences who have never been to the site before because we manually set that up. It tends to be a good balance of not too expensive, but also not limiting our reach. For video action campaigns where you're remarketing, they can get much more expensive, but the trade-off is that you are going after far, far more qualified users. The intent signals are there. The ROAS is there most of the time too. Um, and they honestly can go upwards of 20, 30. I've even seen $40. I do not like when it's $40, but if the ROAS is proving that it's working, um, that's the trade-off that we will accept. Um, so it does range depending on the type, but it's typically around those two ranges depending on who you're going after. So. I think another question Brian asked here is what is the CPM for YouTube ads? And I think that it depends. I get a little concerned getting too deep into conversations about CPC and CPM, and that's cost per click or cost per mil. Um, the reason being that once you are investing in higher intent <clears throat> or more valuable audiences, or you're using targeting tools that are more advanced, your CPC and CPM cost will go up to reflect that investment that your third party or your agency is putting into that. <coughs> Excuse me, so 
I would say we can get you benchmark CPMs in your competitor space, but I would lean out on that and focus on what are your profitability uh, or your overall arching profitability goals and counting on an agency and a Google team that can get you as close to that profitability goal as possible. Because if you're having a conversation about CPM or CPCs, um, it, and I don't want to say that it's a waste of time because in the past it has been an indicator, but in an uh, automated world, that is not the metric that you want to spend time with your consultants talking about. That is a metric that is a means to something else, and that's where we really want to focus on with um, our agency partners and our, and our shared clients moving forward. But we do have planner tools that will help you get um, CPM quotes for planning stage conversations, and that will match the language and the um, kind of benchmarking that you're used to across TV buys, which is really an interesting space that we are currently in and investing a lot of uh, resources in, is getting you planning tools and our agency's planning tools to help you see what you're typically seeing and understanding on the TV buy side. I hope that's helpful, Brian. Oh, yep, cool. I, so just for time's sake, I know we're over, but several people have hung, uh, are hanging back right now. So there's two more questions and I, and I think we could potentially answer one and the other one might be just a little bit too um, uh, unspecific. So uh, Ritaraj, your question is, um, what should we do for a startup that's like doing local business and they want more leads? Um, I think we just need a little more information. Are you are you talking about uh, a startup in the business sector? Is it a restaurant? Is it a brick and mortar? Is it consumer facing B two B? Are those leads um, going to give you endless um, purchases, or is it a one time? Uh, so yeah, that the strategy would be different for absolutely each one of those. Um, lead gen and ecom both can have the same uh, strategic frameworks applied to them, and a strategic framework is a, typically a set of decision making matrices saying if this then that, if this then that. Um, so we don't bifurcate based on lead versus ecom. Within lead and ecom, you have similar matrices. It's an events management company. You can do a lot of the custom intent targeting that, that we talked about. Well, events management to sell tickets for concerts, etc. Um, yeah, you you first you'd want to start developing a segmentation strategy. If you have different segments for each of the events, then based on your target and position, um, you determine who you're going to target, how you're going to position yourself, and then develop an awareness to um, to conversion process. If the person who is performing, for example, at the event can be the advocate, then you'd probably want to create an advocacy-based strategy as well. But um, great place to start, great conversation to have. We happen to manage the apparel for one of the largest um, events, businesses on the planet, if not the largest. Um, and then the more specific question, but I'm not sure if you guys have opinions on it. Can archive YouTube live videos be of value for YouTube ads? Perhaps the best strategy there is to make a sizzle reel of the most informative or interesting sections. Um, that didn't make sense to me, but it, I just, I don't get involved enough in YouTube to understand it. Um, Cesar and Melissa, either one of you guys have an opinion on that? That sounded really specific to me. Uh, I, I can jump in, um, cause I, I use YouTube so frequently. Um, my first initial thought with YouTube live videos is typically when you do a YouTube live, the quality does go down, um, just because you are live streaming it. So that would be my first concern is just like the actual, like HD quality of the video. Um, the second thing though is we do want to be mindful when we are running YouTube ads of 
the content of the ad itself. So if it's just a live video of, you know, maybe you're doing a live with another creator and you're kind of spitballing questions and going through like valuable content for your brand. Um, YouTube ads, we want them to be short. We want them to be to the point and pretty concise for the most part. Um, even though you can run a long YouTube ad, you typically have about five seconds to convince them why to go with your business and why to look at your site or make that conversion. And um, I would have to see honestly the live content to give like a true, like would I use this or would I not answer? But I would just, recommend being mindful of like what's actually going on in the video. If it can be cut down, I mean, we've certainly used UGC content, which is user generated content in the past before to make video ads. I will say they tend to do better on social than they do on YouTube just because of that attention span. Um, I'm not sure if that totally answers the question, but it, there's a lot of components to it, certainly. Um, your team, if you were exclusive, we would just review it and pretty much go through you go through with you the strategy of if we think it's usable or not, and then pivot with whatever strategy we went with. Awesome. Well, thank you, folks, for um, hanging back with us and asking all these questions. We kind of expected that because we were going to focus on something that is narrow but very deep in terms of one subject, that we get a lot of questions. We don't get questions when we go too wide with things. So um, this was great. Uh, thank you, folks, for spending time with us on Wednesday. Melissa, thank you for helping put together um, one of my favorite webinars we've done in a long time here. Um, Cesar, uh, I I hope you don't cough anymore. I uh, thank you so much for for powering through that and for all the great content as well as the, the amazing partnership that you're helping us uh, continue to build with uh, with Google. So thank you everyone. Um, we'll uh, we'll we'll see you on the next webinar in two weeks. Cheers. Everyone. Thank you.